Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. The series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, funded by the Access Scale Computing Project. This series is a collaboration involving the US Department of Energy and Computing Facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley Labs. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, Ashley from Oak Ridge, and I will be the hosts for today's webinar, What's New in SPAC? And the webinar will be presented by Todd Gambling. Uh, Todd is with the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Todd is a computer scientist in the Advanced Technology Office there at Livermore. And his search focuses on scalable tools for measuring, analyzing, and visualizing parallel performance data. In addition to his research, he leads the reproducibility analysis monitoring and performance team there at Livermore. And he's also the lead for the software packaging technologies project in the US scale. Uh, Access scale computing project. He's the creator of SPAC. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, we uh, have sold um, more than 250 tickets for today's webinar. Uh, we'll be uh, all attendees have been muted. So we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc uh, that, that we can see the address and uh, uh, the screen. Uh, so the webinar will have a break so the speaker can respond to the questions that come in. So with that, uh, 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 I'll stop sharing here, Todd, and you take over, please. Okay. Uh, all right. Get that set up. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Asni. Um, so this is, this is a different kind of talk than I usually give on spec. I'm used to giving tutorial talks. Um, and this is about new features and, and the roadmap ahead. Um, there's going to be a brief recap of what SPAC is and what SPAC does, but we're mostly going to talk about new developments and things that you might be interested in uh, for the community. So before I get started, um, I wanted to mention there is, for people who like to talk, a uh, virtual SPAC tutorial July 28th to 29th. Um, you can register at this link down here. Um, it's just like the ones that we give at SC and ISC, um, but it's it's for everyone. And so if people are interested in this, please go to spec tutorial on aws.splashdat.com and, and sign up. Um, we're teaming up with Amazon Web Services to offer this. Um, they're, they're providing the resources that we're gonna run on. Um, and I think it'll be good. Um, we've, we've given one online tutorial before and it, and it went pretty well. And I think we're gonna be able to do a good one for even more people now. All right, so just as a review, um, spec's a package manager for HPC. Um, it lets you install things on your system the, the way that you want to. So if you wanted to install, say, a tool called MPI Leaks with uh, SPAC, you could say SPAC install MPI Leaks. That's unconstrained. It says, hey, just get this thing on my system. Do it, do it whatever way you can, and you know, I'll, I'll accept the defaults. I don't care about any of the other details. Um, SPAC is different from other package managers because you can do things like specify specific versions. You can say, um, I want version 3.3 of that tool, um, or I want it built with a particular compiler um, or a particular compiler at a particular version. You can say that you want particular options um, for the different packages, um, and you can inject things like compiler flags into the build um, or set the build target to a specific architecture instead of um, you know, just the default for x86. Um, and this whole syntax is recursive, uh, you can go through, you can install for, you, know, uh, you, you can specify all of these different constraints for your dependencies as well as for the root package. So you have a lot of control, um, which is something that HPC people tend to like. The idea is that you just specify what you need uh, and SPAC tries to take care of the rest and, and spares you the details of configuring a large stack of software. Um, SPAC packages themselves are templates. Um, and so if you wrap your software up in a package so that you can distribute it to other people in SPAC, it looks kind of like this. Um, every package is a Python class. It has a little metadata up at the top that tells you where to download it, where to get uh, the tarball, um, what versions are available, checksums for them so that it knows that it's downloaded the right version, and then things like options that are available on the package and so on. Um, this says that this is the Kripke package. It's a small deterministic transport app from Livermore. Um, it depends on MPI and CMake. It can be built with MPI optionally. It can be built with uh, OpenMP. And these are the instructions down here for how to build it. So this is saying, these are the CMake arguments. Um, this is how you enable OpenMP and MPI, if, uh, depending on how the user asked for uh, the, the software. And then this is how you install. And essentially in SPAC, uh, the packages are just templates that tell you how to go from a spec, which is what the user types on the command line. That's this spec here. 
to a prefix, which is where you install the package. So it's just a Python script that says, hey, build this thing this way. And all you're doing is you're translating this, this spec that the user specified into an actual installation of the software. Um, so it's easy to make packages. Um, and this is what a typical package looks like. They can get quite a bit more complicated than this, um, but this, this is the gist. Um, all the stuff about how it can be built is up here, and the instructions are down here. Um, Spec handles combinatorial complexity. So if you build a template like this, you may want to build lots of different versions of your package. And essentially, in Spec, every unique graph, every configuration of the package is a unique configuration, which maps to an, a unique installation. So if your software looks like this, and this is MPI leaks, it depends on call path and MPI. Um, call path depends on the Dynance library, which depends on LibDorf, which depends on LibElf, and so on. Um, Every different configuration of, of any of these packages means that you know, MPI leaks will have a different installation. It's a, it's a Merkle bag, basically. That we hash these things. And each one of these uh, packages that we install gets a unique directory uh, where we install those things. Um, we manage the dependencies by embedding our paths into binaries. So if you were to run the MPI leaks tool out of here, it would know where the libraries for all these other things are, um, because we embedded that in the executable and in the libraries. And that's, that basically enables you to have lots and lots of different versions uh, that can coexist with each other, because each one knows which specific directory in here um, its dependencies correspond to. We try to avoid things like LD library path inspect because they're kind of unwanted global variables. You set them in your environment, and they sort of apply to everything. Um, and often, if you're, if you're dealing with different versions of dependencies, that's not what you want. You might want to run one application with one version of MPI another application with another, or you know, so on for different dependency versions. So this is how we manage combinatorial installs. Um, sort of the core of SPAC, and something that I'll talk about later, is uh, called the concretizer. Um, this is how we do dependency resolution. It's how we go from this syntax here, MPI leaks, depends on call path at version 1.0 with the debug option, and depends on libelf at 0.8.11, to a concrete installation. And so the user gives you this, and they say SPAC install, MPI leaks, blah, blah. And what we do is uh, we turn that into a abstract uh, graph. And so this is MPI leaks. And you can see that the constraints from the spec have been put on the DAG. And we fleshed it out in to include all the dependencies that we know about. Um, as we do that, um, we, we then stick it in the concretizer. And that gives us a fully spec'd out uh, graph. And so what you're seeing here is every compiler, um, every version, every option has been set in this DAG. And this is basically what is passed to the template to install. So by the time you get to your build instructions, you already know what you're supposed to build. And you don't have to do a lot of things like poking around on the system and seeing if you know, some package is installed in some location. You already know. Spec told you. And so all you have to do is say, OK, if the configuration looks like this, build this. If the configuration looks like this, build this. Um, set the architecture to whatever it says, and, and so on. And so that really simplifies the process of writing build scripts. Um, for every package, we store this information um, on, the, on the disk in a, in a YAML file. Um, we have a database of these things that tells us all the installations that have happened, all their hashes, all their metadata. So you can query for installs and, and manage lots of different installs of the same packages uh, together on the same machine. So it's good for benchmarking. It's good for large facility deployments. It's good for development because you can build lots of different versions of things. Um, and uh, we're trying to enable the thing to be as flexible as possible. Um, to give HPC users the control that they tend to want. Um, you can use SPAC spec to see the results of concretization. So this is what SPAC will spit out to show you, you know, how it actually built the MPI leaks tool. You can see that the real tool is a bit more complicated than what I showed in the example. Um, but you know, here are all the packages. This is MPI leaks at version 1.0. It's built with this compiler, and it has this architecture. This is boost. It has a million different options. This is what they're set to. And it's built with this compiler and this architecture as well, and, and so on. Um, SPAC, we started the project in 2013, and it's, it's gotten to be pretty popular since then. Um, we started with, you know, when we first went public, maybe 170 software packages, mostly written by folks at Livermore. Um, we're up to 4,300 software packages in the mainline with, you know, almost 3,000 monthly users of our documentation site and over 600 contributors. And so um, we've really managed to grow the project where we have worldwide participation. And um, you know, most of the packages are contributed by people external to Livermore. Um, it's a big collaboration of, of a lot of different sites. Um, this is the growth of our users on the documentation site over time. So you can see you know, the monthly active users, I guess, as recently as 2018, 
was down around a thousand, but we've grown up to you know, 2000 in the middle of 2019. And then now we're up close to 3000 monthly active users on the doc site now, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, it's also pretty daunting because of how much activity there is on the site. And so Stack is used on a number of the top HPC systems. Um, so Fugaku uh, it came to Recan, it's number one now, um, is, is deployed using SPAC. The user stack on Fugaku was, was built there. We've had a collaboration with them um, since they started setting up the machine. Um, they liked the tool because it was easy to get packages running on ARM and to add patches and things to existing open source software that they wanted built on the Fugaku machine. Um, SPAC's been used on Summit at Oak Ridge. Uh, the Oak Ridge folks built about 1,300 packages um, on that system with SPAC. Um, they can rebuild it overnight or, or in a few hours. Um, and, and SPAC has really sped up the deployment there. Livermore uses it on Sierra. And then machines like SuperMuck NG in, in, uh, in Germany uh, use SPAC as well. So we have a lot of the big machines um, in addition to the, the sort of more uh, small commodity HPC systems. Um, this is what one month of SPAC development looks like on the project. Um, so this is June 20, uh, 2020 to July 2020. This is a couple days ago. Um, you can see, you know, we have a lot of contributors putting things into the project. Um, so it's not just, you know, a few people uh, contributing to SPAC. It's, it's a lot of different people. Um, there's obviously some core developers who contribute more than others. Um, but we merged 333 pull requests from all sorts of different people every month, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, it, and we're, we're grateful to members of the community who just volunteer to help maintain the project. It's not just our core developers, but um, other folks who, who have volunteered to just take part in the project, review pull requests, and make sure that they get merged. Um, the contributions are growing. Um, you can see that they're pretty diverse. Um, this is showing the history of the project since about 2013 when we started up until now. Um, this is the core up here. And so um, this is, this is the, the main SPAC tool. And you can see that about half of it was written by folks at Livermore. Um, and, and that's still true today. But we've gotten a lot of different uh, contributions from other organizations. And then down here in the packages, it's way more diverse. So Livermore is this top um, chunk. But we're probably less than 10% of the total contributions to the, to the package stack in SPAC. And that's the recipes themselves. So we mostly maintain the core tool these days. All right. So that's the sort of a review of, of the SPAC community and the, the core features. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've been doing to change kind of the, the workflow uh, to manage the project over time. So one thing that we've done um, is we've, we've developed a release workflow um, starting from about, I guess, two supercomputings ago from, from 2018. Um, we started making these uh, project boards on GitHub. And they look like this, where there's to do, there's in progress, there's uh, you know review in progress, uh, and so on up until done. And essentially, um, if we have major features or things that need to get implemented for particular releases, we put them in a project board per release. So we're doing major releases, which are things like 013, 014, and so on. Um, and we put big features into those, and we also have point releases. But each one gets a board, um, and it makes it easy to um, you know to, to schedule work. Um, we're trying to crank out releases more regularly so that you'll have tarballs of SPAC that you can rely on. Um, and if things don't get done for a particular release, we'll just move them to the next one. And so uh, we're, we're really trying to do this on a regular sort of clock as opposed to when things are ready, which tended to slow down our release process. Um, so we're shooting for quarterly releases. I think we're, we're hitting about three or four releases per year. And I'm going to talk about some of the more recent ones in here, um, three or four major releases. We do bug fix releases as well. And so that's what this looks like. That's, this is what bug fix releases look like. Um, we've developed this branching strategy where um, I think most people still use back on the develop branch. It moves along over time. But at different points in time, we branch off a major release from the develop branch and we'll tag it. So this would be 013 here. Um, and we've, we've started backporting bug fixes to these stable releases so that um, they get more stable over time. Essentially, um, we'll, we'll break off a 013 release. That includes a certain set of packages at a certain set of versions, and that's what we freeze with the releases. And then we backport bug fixes to the core tool on top of that. And so over time, if you check out 0.13, um, you can upgrade to 0.13.1 without any disturbance to your software stack, no changes in the packages or anything, just fixes in the core tool. And then eventually we'll bring out 0.14 um, and, and so on. Um, we're up to 0.15 now, and we keep backporting bug fixes to things. We, we just put out 0.15.1, and we're working on a 0.14.3 release to include some of the, the fixes that were there. So our expectation is that people can rely on these releases over time. 
Um, if you want to maintain something like a stable facility deployment, you could pick a stack release um, and just keep pulling on the release branch um, to get these bug fixes without disturbing the stack. That's the idea. And if you want to stay on the bleeding edge, there's always develop. We do CI on develop, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. All right. So SPAC 013 was released in November at Supercomputing 2019. Um, it had some, some uh, pretty big improvements to the stack. So SPAC stacks was the main one. Um, this is some extra uh, deployment logic for facilities, um, and, as well as the specific microarchitecture feature in, um, in chaining. I won't talk about chaining, but the other two are, um, are the big ones I wanted to talk about. Um, so the main thing that you'll notice if you check out a SPAC version that's, that's more recent than, than 0.13 um, is that you know, it does not build for just x86-64 anymore or just PowerPC-64 LE. It builds for a specific target. And what that means is if you've ever tried to figure out what your, uh, what your processor is on your machine, this is what it looks like. So you get a lot of information from proc CPU info or from syscontrol on Macs, but it's not really intuitive. You get something that looks like this. And so this says you know, Intel Xeon CPU ES2695. There are a bunch of features down here, um, but it doesn't really say the name that you're used to. And so you know, we don't know what that is. Um, we know that these are the features that we kind of care about, but they can be a little opaque as well. Um, and you know, most people would call this Broadwell, um, and they, they would know what that means. And so one of the things that we've done in SPAC is we've built the packages for specific architectures now. So we have this support where um, if you do SPAC arch dash dash known targets, um, you can see all the different targets the SPAC knows about. That includes generic ones so that you could build for a generic target. Um, but we will also try to, we will try to build packages for the most recent um, architecture available for your system. So if you're on a Skylake machine and SPAC knows how to detect that, um, we will say this is a Skylake machine and we'll build Skylake binaries. Um, the one exception to that is if you have an old compiler um, we also know what compilers can generate code for different targets. And so if you have a compiler like GCC4 that can't generate code for recent architectures, then we won't, we'll downgrade the target so that we know what it was built for and, and what it's compatible with. And so we can do things internally like compare Skylake to Broadwell. We know that, Sky, that Broadwell binaries are compatible with Skylake because Skylake is more recent, um, or, and that Skylake binaries are not compatible with Broadwell and so on. Um, this has also enabled us to uh, simplify packages. And um, things like OpenBloss and, and some of the packages that really do care about architectural features used to have to jump through hoops to figure out what was available on the current machine. Um, and so they would duplicate this kind of logic. Now they can just ask. They can say, if AVX512 is in spec.target, so that just means if my architecture supports AVX512, then just add the AVX512 option to the config line. So it's much easier to write packages like this, like OpenBloss and FFTW, where you care about these, these vector instructions. Um, the other thing that we can do is you can specify the target on the command line. So you can say SPAC install, say LDAN or Petsy, and, and target a specific microarchitecture. So if you're on you know, a Skylake machine um, and you don't want to build for Skylake, you could build for Broadwell. Um, you could build for an older uh, architecture that doesn't have all the instructions if you want to be more portable. And people do that for things like hybrid clusters where they have different types of processors. But by default, we will build a binary and we'll say, hey, this, this binary is good um, for Skylake so that you know uh, where you can use it. We spun this library out um, because we really like to get vendor participation um, to, to track all these different CPUs. And so it's called ArchSpec. Um, you can go to github.com slash ArchSpec. This is actually a collaboration with Kenneth Host from uh, EasyBuild. And um, you know, we, we would really like to have vendors contribute specs of, uh, of their latest chips so that we can detect them all and query the features correctly. And so we've actually gotten um, two new contributions just recently to ArchSpec uh, for Graviton and Graviton2, which are the cloud um, ARM chips. And so I think it's working so far, at least a little bit. Um, but we'd like more. So if you know vendors um, who, who are putting out chips and you have a connection there, recommend this to them and tell them to, to contribute to ArchSpec so that we can have a library to detect this stuff and get common names for these, these architectures so that we can easily distribute binaries for them. Um, so that's something that came out of 0.13. All right. So the other thing that you may remember is um, in, in SPAC since 0.12, um, we've had environments. And um, environments are a lot like virtual environments uh, in other package managers like Conda or, uh, or uh, Python's virtual end tool, um, where essentially you can group a set of installations together and load them up so that they're all in your environment at one time. Um, what we've added to this is we've tried to combine the features of other package managers that have manifests and lock files, where 
know, if you've used cargo or something like that, there's a cargo.toml that says these are the things that you need to install. Um, and it'll spit out a file called cargo.lock um, that says this is what I built exactly. And so in SPAC, um, we have this file called spac.yaml um, that can include some configuration for how you want things built. Um, you can include external files or you can just write the configuration, um, like what your uh, concretization preferences are and things up here. Um, and then a list of specs. And these are just the kind of same kind of specs that you would write on the command line uh, in SPAC. So HDF5, libelf, OpenMPI. And you can put options on these. So if you want OpenMPI built with a particular fabric, you could put that option on there. If you want HDF5 with the parallel library, you could do HDF5 plus parallel and so on. Um, if you just say, uh, if you activate this environment and say SPAC install, um, SPAC will go and install all of these different specs. And it'll spit out what we're calling a spec.lock file that has specifically what it built. And so this is, so essentially, this is an abstract spec for a bunch of packages that you want to use together. And this is a concrete spec for a bunch of packages that you want to use together. So if you wanted to reproduce this stack, you could take the lock file and rebuild from it on the same machine. It's tied to the machine. Um, if you wanted to reproduce it you know, functionally, um, but not um, you know, exactly like it was built on another platform, you can take this YAML file and hand it to someone and say, here, install this. And so the idea is that you could take the same spec.yaml and build it on, say, an Intel machine or a PowerPC machine and have different spec.log files for those two configurations. Um, and so it's sort of a requirements and um, a what actually happened model with, with a file format associated with it. Now, so this is simple for um, a single prefix where you want everything in one environment. Um, but it's not something that's scalable to um, a facility deployment, at least not until 0.13. So in 0.13, um, what we did was we added this thing called spac stacks, where um, you, can add, you can have combinatorial elements in an environment. And so what this means is you can define something like this. You can say, here's some definitions. There's a compiler list here. This is GCC 5.4, Clang 3.8, Intel 18. Um, you can have some MPIs. And you can have a bunch of different packages in here. And um, in your spec list, instead of just a list of specs, you can have a matrix. And what this is saying is just take the cross product of these three lists or the, take the Cartesian product of these three lists. And so it says build Nalu, HDF5, Hyper, Trillinus, and Petsy with all combinations of these compilers and these MPIs. So it'll build Nalu for GCC and Mbappage. It'll build Nalu for GCC and Mbappage 2.3. It'll build Nalu for Clang and Mbappage and so on. Um, and so it's easy to specify very large um, combinatorial matrices of packages for a facility. Um, and we spit out the same kind of lock file for this where you know, once you're done installing this, there's a lock file available and you could reproduce the installation from it. Um, you can have for each of these uh, stacks its own uh, module configuration. And so down here, you know, this is LMOD configuration here. Um, you can set how the packages are named in the module hierarchy and so on, what's included in the hierarchy. And so that's good for facilities. Um, they can have um, some module configuration associated with their packages. And the hope is that we can make you know, what used to be some fairly complicated scripts into a simple configuration file for facility installations. Um, there's tweaking that needs to be done when you do these installs at facilities, but, but that's the goal. Um, the, the, the typical SPAC stack looks a bit more complicated than this, at least right now. All right. So SPAC 014 was released um, earlier this year. And um, this added a bunch of other new features that build on these environments. And so what we're really focusing on is, is how can we flesh out the environments so that they're useful for lots of different workflows. Um, so there's GitLab, GitLab pipeline generation where we have CI integrated with the environments. Um, there's, you can generate a container recipe from an environment now. And we added this distributed and parallel build feature. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. So the parallel builds um, are done a little differently than you might expect. Um, if you, it, it, does not submit, it doesn't require resource manager integration or anything. Um, essentially, we made it so that SPAC works correctly when run concurrently. And so we implemented a distributed locking algorithm. It knows about F control locks on your file system. Um, if you just run two SPACs side by side and tell them to install the same thing, they'll coordinate on which packages to build from the bottom up. And so if you build Trilinos um, and you want to help out your existing build because a few more cores came available on your login node or on another login node, you could just run another instance of SPAC and it would see um, what locks were held by the other SPAC instance and it'll build the ones that aren't currently being built. Um, and it, it, we've, we've implemented this so that it knows where all the dependencies are. Um, and you could run you know, four of them or 10 of them uh, together um, for a, a parallel build. So you don't need um, any particular resource manager integration. SPAC doesn't have to know how to talk to Slurm. You can just say srun-n8-n32 SPAC install. 
um, with some level of parallelism for the SPAC install. Um, and this will basically spawn a whole bunch of SPAC jobs out on the nodes of your cluster um, that work together. Um, the other sort of benefit of this is for multi-user installations. Um, if two users are running together, um, they will coordinate correctly and they won't step on each other. So that's, that's an improvement that happened in 014. So in addition to that, um, we've been expanding environments. And so one of the features that we added for 014 was the ability to take um, a SPAC environment like this, where you have a list of specs like Gromax plus MPI and MPitch, and generate from that a uh, multi-stage Docker recipe. And so what that means is um, you, can, you can pretty much take any environment. You don't have to specify all this container stuff that I'm showing here. Um, you can take any environment and you can say SPAC containerize uh, with the environment activated. And what we'll do is we will generate a recipe where we make one image uh, that has the compilers and, and such in it, and we install all of that. Um, we, we build the artifact. And then another, in, and it'll make another image that just has the things that you want to run. So the final version of this image will strip out all the compilers, all the build dependencies, and all the things that make the image really big. Um, and you'll just end up with Gromax and MPitch installed, uh, along with all of their dependencies in the final image. Um, we stripped the binaries, and so we can make some pretty small images out of this. Um, and you can see here in the Docker file, it's a little tiny, but um, there's a builder image here. We're using this multi-stage syntax, and then there's the actual final artifact here that copies in all the things that were built from the build image. And essentially, the build just uses SPAC inside. Um, and right now, we base this on SPAC images on Docker Hub, but we have some stuff in flight where we will allow you to specify different base images for this. So you could basically build um, your SPAC environment with whatever base image. If your facility wants a particular one, or if you have a particular OS you like, um, you could install SPAC stuff on top of that. That's the goal. But this exists. It's in 0.14, um, and it'll generate your recipe like this. Uh, we can generate singularity recipes too. Um, they don't do the multi-stage stuff because at the time we wrote this, uh, singularity didn't um, support multi-stage builds. I forget if they do now, but um, hopefully this is this is still pretty useful to people. And you can run your Docker images in singularity anyway, so you can you can still use Docker to build and singularity to run if you want the small images. So on top of that, um, the other thing that we've added to um, environments that that came out in 0.14. Um, is we've been working with Kitware. Um, they have uh, done a lot of implementation of um, CI automation. And so if you think of these YAML files that we have in SPAC, uh, where you have some definitions and a matrix of packages, or maybe you just have a package list, um, you might want to build that in CI. Um, what you can do is you can specify a GitLab CI section in your, uh, in your YAML file. And you can specify these things called mappings here, where what this is, all this is really saying is, um, you know, these definitions in this matrix will result in a list of things to build. It's going to come out with a list of concrete specs, and they're going to have different attributes on them. Like they might say, this one needs to be built for Ubuntu, and this one needs to be built for CentOS, and this one needs to be built for Skylake, and this one needs to be built for Broadwell. Um, you, can have map, you can have matching syntax down here, um, where essentially you have uh, mappings, like this says spec cloud Ubuntu. This matches all the specs that are for Ubuntu 18. And it says, run these on a GitLab runner um, in Kubernetes uh, that has uh, this builder associated, uh, that, that uses this image. And this is an Ubuntu image. And then for CentOS, what you're saying is, I want to build that, I want to build everything that should be built for CentOS with a CentOS image. And so it lets you set up um, a build farm essentially on any GitLab instance. Um, and what we generate is this uh, DAG of jobs in GitLab uh, from your environment. So this is another way to build in parallel. You can fire up a GitLab instance. You could use another GitLab instance. Um, we will farm the jobs out to all of your runners in the GitLab instance using SPAC CI. Um, and we're leveraging some newer features in GitLab to do this. Um, the, we, we had older versions that used multiple repos, but there's been a, a recent feature in GitLab that lets you essentially generate the YAML to describe your build um, on the fly. And so um, you can make a repo. Um, with just this YAML file in it. Um, you can run SPAC CI in it, and then uh, we will generate a child pipeline from um, the, the job that ran SPAC CI um, with all of this stuff in it. So it's pretty automatic. Um, you can send progress reports to CDASH. You can see an example of that at cdash.spac.io. Um, but this stuff is, is uh, working, and this is in 0.14. Um, this is documented in the pipeline section of the SPAC docs if you want to take a look at it. Um, one way that we made use of this workflow um, is we took the image that we used for our SPAC tutorial and we, we built it in SPAC CI. And so we have um, you know, a, a repo on GitHub over here um, that we, we have hooked up GitLab CI to. Um, GitLab has this ability to do CI for a GitHub project. Um, this generates a pipeline over in, in GitLab. 
Um, once the pipeline passes in GitLab, um, we report status back onto the, the GitHub job. And once that's done and merged into the, the master branch on this repository, um, Docker Hub picks it up and just builds a container um, with the binaries that we generated in this build process. So essentially, the, this pipeline can populate a mirror of binary packages um, where um, you have all of the artifacts that you need available. Um, and then when you go to build on Docker Hub, um, there's a time limit on these builds, but it doesn't matter because you're just installing binaries at this point from the, the pipeline that generated them over here. Um, and once that's done, you can go and run the container with Docker. And this is how we build the container that we use in our SPAC tutorial with all the binaries in it. Um, one of the goals that we have under ECP um, is to get this kind of CI going at different facilities at um, different laboratories. And so this is not done yet. Um, the, the, these sites are not running pipelines yet, but our hope is that on major supercomputer centers or on major machines um, at the different labs, we could have this GitLab CI stuff running, um, and then we could upload binaries to a public mirror. Um, and then you know, users could come along and download the binaries and they wouldn't have to build. That's, that's what we're working towards. We're not there yet, but you can see how all these pieces fit together to do this. Um, the specific target stuff basically means that we can use the binary, we know where we can use the binaries that we generate in SPAC. Um, and then you know, with this public mirror that we're, gonna, that we're setting up, um, we would be able to download them for SPAC users. Um, it's not done yet again, but um, this is something that we're working towards under ECP. All right, so SPAC 015 was released two weeks ago, so this is getting us up to the present. Um, and uh, this, there were a lot of different features in this one, but I think the biggest one is this external find command, um, where essentially now packages can specify how they could be found on the system. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a source code mirror for SPAC packages, I'll talk about that, and then we have, we've actually started using some of our CI to test uh, the builds in SPAC, and we really hope to expand that. Um, there's better Cray support. We're working pretty closely uh, with Cray um, on the El Capitan and Frontier uh, contracts to, to support SPAC and make sure that it works in that environment. Um, so there's a lot of detection uh, improvements and things to make SPAC work across different Cray systems. Um, and we're working on features that would enable us to better know what's in, what's in the Cray programming environment and how best to use it um, when we concretize SPAC packages. And there's a few other features here I'm not going to get into. All right, so SPAC external find is new. Um, it used to be that you could just specify your build instructions in your SPAC package where you said, here's how I install this thing. I'm given a spec, um, now I have to build it and install it on my machine. Um, we've also had this feature in SPAC for a long time called externals where you can specify, you know, here, open MPI at, at you know, 1.14 is installed in this directory. And you could tell SPAC about your, your software that's already on your system and you could build against it. Um, it's a bit of a pain to set that file up. And so what we've done is we've made it so that uh, packages can do something a lot like what we do for detecting compilers already, where the CMake package, for example, now says, hey, my executables look like this. There's an executable called CMake. And if you find something like that in my path, um, go and run this function to query it for what exactly kind of CMake install it is. And so basically what this does is it, it builds a spec. It says, hey, CMake at 3.14 is installed in this prefix um, that I found while I was going out and querying the user's path. And it'll generate the configuration that you need for that. And so you can see here that you've got packages, CMake paths, and now it says CMake at 3.15.1 is installed in user local. Um, so what that does is it, it takes the burden off the user to specify all this stuff. And it sort of standardizes the way that we query um, external packages and, and you know, the user doesn't have to know how. They don't have to know quite as much about um, how to query a package for a version, it can just be in the packages. Um, we've only implemented this for a few packages so far, like, like CMake, um, but um, as always happens when we introduce features like this, we have a bunch of rather OCD people on the SPAC project who just love to take features like this and expand them to all the packages. So um, you should be seeing lots of support emerging for um, different sorts of build dependencies, at least um, in SPAC. Um, I think we can get this working for things like MPI um, as well. Um, but it's a little tricky with with libraries and so you know this right now what we do is we find executables in your path um, we query them and so for mpi that'll work um, we'll be able to do things like mpi cc dash dash show me um, to query information about libraries um, that can give us versions it can give us libraries and things for the mpi uh, implementation but for libraries where uh, we don't have a wrapper like this um, it's a bit harder to query and so I don't expect this to work for all different libraries on your system, uh, at least not right away. But what we'd like to be able to support is 
you know, somehow inspecting those in the future to figure out their properties, but we haven't worked that out yet. So think of this as a feature for de detecting all of the sort of troublesome build dependencies that you don't usually want to build in spec. Um, you can find them from your environment and then go and focus on building the thing that you want to build. The other thing in 0.15 um, that we've added uh, is we've introduced a source code mirror. So if you've been using SPAC for a while, you may have noticed that um, the packages tend to download from authoritative sources. Um, they, some of them have mirrors in them, like the GNU ones. Um, but big outages uh, would, would cause SPAC to not work. So if, um, if SourceForge goes down, if the GNU mirror goes down, you would just get an error fetching and you couldn't fetch your tarball. Um, but now we've deployed a mirror of our own um, where basically we're putting all the different sources and patches and other resources that you need to build um, on the web um, in our own S3 bucket. And so this is now the first place SPAC will search uh, for packages uh, and it'll, it'll download the binary from here um, if it can. And if not, then it'll go and find it in an authoritative source. And our goal is to keep this populated with basically everything in SPAC so that if other things go down, we're still in business, you can still build um, and you can rely on SPAC even on weekends where GNU is moving their servers from one closet to another as happened, I think, uh, earlier last year. The other thing that we've started doing in 0.15 um, that you might not notice is um, we've started using ECP's E4S software stack to test SPAC. And so what I mean by that is um, SPAC contributions are coming in on GitHub all the time. Um, we're using the CI features that I pointed out earlier to test E4S with a, um, with a YAML configuration just for E4S. And so E4S itself is like 50 or 60 different packages and with dependencies it's like 250 of them um, that ECP cares about. It's coming out of the, the US Exascale Project's uh, software technology stack. And um, every time that someone contributes something to SPAC, um, we are triggering SPAC CI and building a pipeline um, to test all these builds. And so if they've changed uh, from one commit to the next, we will rebuild them and make sure that they still continue to build, at least in cloud uh, environments. And so right now we're doing this um, in a Kubernetes cluster on AWS um, for about 250 packages uh, where we're building on CentOS 6, CentOS 7, and Ubuntu. And um, we're hoping to expand the number of OSs, compilers, and architectures that we provide there. Um, Livermore is also, uh, we, we are working on getting a cluster set up uh, in the open where we could basically run on the architectures we care about. So we would have some NVIDIA nodes, some um, ARM nodes, some power nodes, and, and maybe some AMD and AMD GPU nodes that we could do builds on. Um, we haven't gotten that set up yet, but this is, this is sort of the direction we're going where we'd like to just expand this CI and start testing on more and more platforms and get the, 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 uh, the get stack vetted. And so right now we do this on PRs um, where we run a pipeline and the status, you can see the status update on a lot of different SPAC PRs right now. Um, at the moment, because of a limitation in GitLab, we're only doing this on PRs that originate in the SPAC re repo, um, but this will be happening on all PRs soon. And then, um, we, we will be, we're also doing this kind of testing on our release branches. And so for 0.15, we ran the whole E4S stack. Um, it builds in our cloud environments and um, we're able to vet releases that way. Um, eventually this will be used to populate a public binary cache, like I was saying, where we basically have all the E4S binaries available in SPAC. And so if you clone SPAC and try to install something that's in the ECP stack, um, or as we expand this other stacks, um, you'll be able to install it from binaries. And so you can learn more about E4S at E4S.io. Um, that's down here. And um, th there's a lot of details there for, about what's in the stack um, and about the work that goes into maintaining these, these particular stack packages. All right. So for the last part of the talk, um, I want to talk about the concretizer, uh, which is kind of at the core of SPAC. And um, like I said, this is the thing that takes the abstract spec that you specify on the command line um, and, or in one of these YAML files, and that turns it into the concrete spec that we, that we actually build in SPAC. And um, in SPAC, this is pretty complicated. We have a lot of different places where we can pull build information from. So we get it not just from the command line, not just from, from environments, but from local configuration, from SPAC defaults, and from the package repositories themselves. There's information in all of these places that affect um, the defaults that in, in, you know, what the constraints are on how we can build a particular package. Um, it turns out this is an MP hard problem, and um, the current implementation in, in SPAC is, is actually using a greedy algorithm where we make some decisions, probably, we make some decisions too early. Um, we'll, we will say, you know, this node is at this version um, without looking for whether there's a conflict down the road, and so this can cause 
um, conflicts to be reported where they really shouldn't be uh, in SPAC. And, it, and we don't do enough backtracking to, to solve all the different places um, that we need. Um, to add to that, the code's gotten pretty complicated because we're pulling from all these different places. Um, and so we, need, we, we needed a new version of the concretizer. So um, I'm going to talk about the prototypes that we use for that. Um, if you think about what is managed by most dependency managers, um, it is something like the name of the package and the version. And so that's, and, and maybe some dependency constraints like this, where the, you know, this, this name and version depend on, so foo depends on var at greater than or equal to 2.0 and baz depends on, and baz greater than 3.0. Um, but the package is, the package model is pretty simple. It's just a name and a version, maybe some features for systems like cargo, uh, but it's not a lot of detail. In SPAC, we're solving for a lot more stuff. So this is a typical package manager. Um, these are all the types of things that we put into a SPAC solve. And so it's, thing, it's, it's all those things I showed on the first slide. It's the version, the architecture, it's the compiler, um, all the different build options and, and compile flags, um, and also all of that for all the dependencies. And so we have a lot more stuff to consider uh, when we do a, a solve on this, this stuff, which is why we wrote a custom concretizer in the first place. Um, SAT solvers are what people typically use for this, um, but they are pretty low level. So if you look at what other systems use for, for solving, um, Conda uses PicoSAT with a bunch of um, booleans, with, with a bunch of custom logic on top of it to do arithmetic and to do optimization. Um, there's a thing called libsolve um, that can do this sort of package version model of, of uh, packages and solve uh, cases like that for other package managers. It's used in things like the SUSE package manager and I, I think by, um, by Yum as well. Um, but it's not extendable to all the things that we want to solve for in SPAC. Um, and so, you know, we, we've been looking at ways that we could implement something like this, um, but more sophisticated. So the two things that we settled on um, that, that we could potentially implement the SPAC concretizer in were um, SMT solvers, which is called it's satisfiability modular theories. Um, these are logic solvers, but they also have things like um, you can do arithmetic constraints, you can do optimization. Um, you can spit out proofs of why things are unsatisfiable. Um, there's some pretty cool features in, in tools like Z3. Um, and then ASP is called answer set programming, um, not active server pages. Um, th this is another type of solver that uses something that looks like prolog as the input. Um, it supports a lot of the same features as Z3. Um, and the main ones that we need are, you know, we, we like the first order logic and we want to be able to do optimization on the specs. So we've been looking at these. Um, we have a prototype um, in ASP. Um, we're using Klingo, which is the, the Potasco grounder and solver package. Um, it's, it's a combination of something called Gringo, which is the grounder, and Clasp, which is, a, which is an ASP solver. And essentially, this simplifies our algorithm quite a bit. Um, it, instead of having to write this rather Baroque algorithm um, for doing all of the things that we do in SPAC, um, we can we can write a declarative program that just has a list of facts generated from our package repository. And so for a typical spec in SPAC, um, you know, 6,000 to 9,000 facts is typical. Um, it looks kind of like this over here where you can see like this is for UCX. Um, we have, you know, version declared UCX 161, that's our favorite one. Version declared UCX 1601, that's our second favorite one and so on. Um, this is information about variants. There's information about dependencies in here. There's lots of different facts that we're solving on. Um, in these SPAC packages. Um, and then in addition to that, we have a small logic program that I guess is now about 300 lines um, that has the, the core logic over these facts that we use to um, guarantee you know, valid uh, concrete specs. And so that's what we do. Um, and the algorithm essentially underneath just searches um, for a configuration that satisfies all of these things. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. Um, and, and these things can go pretty fast. Um, but that's basically what we're doing. We say what the spec should look like, we say what the facts are, and then we go and we, we solve that with um, these, these ASP solvers. Um, typically, the solve itself takes a fraction of a second right now. Um, the grounding takes a while because essentially it has to um, convert a bunch of first order logic uh, clauses uh, to, to clauses for each of these um, you know, uh, propositional uh, facts in the, uh, in, the, in the program spec. Um, and so that can take a while, um, but at least the, the solving is pretty fast. It can fall off a cliff sometimes, and so we have to be careful about how we construct it. This is kind of what's taking the concretizer a while to get implemented. Um, there are places where you know, certain aspects of a spec can be slow. Um, when I tried to optimize versions and uh, targets and compilers at the same time, um, I ran into certain situations where if I didn't set some heuristics on the solver, 
um, it would fall off a cliff and take a long time. What the nice thing about this is it makes it very easy to put the logic in one place. Um, essentially in ASP, what you do is you define the space of packages and so, or the space of possible solutions. And so what this is saying in, in sort of cryptic prologue language is that if something is a node in the spec bag, that implies that there's exactly one lower bound one, upper bound one um, version on that, pa on that node um, out of all the possible versions. So basically this is, this is saying that the space of things Every time you have a node that you discover, um, there's a certain number of possible versions for that node, and you have to pick one version from all those possible versions. Um, we say things like, if a version is declared, but it's conflicted, if there's a conflict, then you, you, that's not possible, that's not a valid solution. Um, and then we put in these sort of uh, minimization pragmas here that say, you know, we weight the versions um, according to some preferences, and then we just minimize that weight over the whole bag. Um, I'll talk about why we minimize it uh, later, um, but uh, this, this is a pretty simple spec um, that says an awful lot in a lot of words, so it makes our, our algorithm more maintainable. Um, other logic has become pretty simple as well. Um, so one of the problems that we had in the previous version of the concretizer is that there was a little bit of a chicken and egg problem between picking a target and picking the right compiler to use for a build. So if the user uh, if if the user picks a compiler, then you can pick sort of the best target that compiler supports with respect to what you're building on. Um, if the user picks a target, you could pick the compiler that supports that target or the most recent one. But if they don't pick either, you kind of have to optimize both of those at the same time. Um, and so all we do now um, is you know instead of having some complicated logic where you know one side of the the solver one side of the concretizer says you know if the compiler is set then you know, um, pick a target. If not, then wait for the compiler to be set and so on. Um, now we just say, don't, um, don't make nodes where the compiler for the node doesn't support the target. That's all we have to tell the thing. And then it's smart enough not to pick configurations that look like that. Um, so this, is, this has been pretty cool to, to specify things in ASP. Um, dependency logic is more concise than it used to be. This is a lot less code than what we had. Um, I won't get into all the details here, um, but we can do things like, specify virtual dependency logic pretty easily. We can say, you know, if, if there's a node and it's supposed to be an MPI, then, you know, you can pick one of the MPI implementations that's available and that's what should go on the node. Um, there's, there are lots of really simple things that we can say um, and then throw the, that to the solver and let it deal with all the complicated logic that stems from that. Um, not everything was simple. Um, the learning curve for ASP and for solvers in general is pretty high. I mean, if you haven't been exposed to this domain before, it can take a while to get in the right mindset for doing, you know, a, a solve on these large combinatorial spaces. Um, and, you know, the, the thought per line of concretizer code is a lot higher than it used to be because there's a lot less code. Um, the examples look simple when you tell them uh, to someone, um, but coming up with them is a lot harder. Um, so that, that can be tedious. Um, structuring the optimization criteria can be a challenge. Um, so for example, um, Picking whether to maximize or minimize something is interesting. Um, things can have ramifications that you don't expect. Um, so if you if you have something like um, if you have optional dependencies in your graph, and you want to pick the most recent version of all the nodes in the graph, um, what you could do is you could say maximize the sum of all the versions in the graph. And what that inadvertently does is it makes the solver say, oh, well, I can just keep adding dependencies to this graph. So I'll just pick the, the most recent version of everything and I'll add as many dependencies to the graph as I can. And so it sort of tends to flip on flags where you didn't expect it to and just build these gigantic DAGs. Um, so we switched all those criteria to minimize, um, which sort of inherently keeps the graph tight. Um, we, we assign these weights to versions that, that use minimization semantics instead of maximization. And that solved that problem, but it was pretty interesting to see sort of the ways that the instructions could go wrong. Um, and then here's another exciting sort of uh, weird case that we found. Um, if you've used SPAC recently, you may have seen that, you know, if you type this into SPAC, if you say SPAC install HDF5 with mPitch, um, you kind of have to help the concretizer along a little bit right now. So you have to say SPAC install HDF5 plus MPI to say MPI should be on and then caret mPitch. And it's it, because it's too dumb at the moment to know um, that MPI has to be on for mPitch to be in the DAG. Um, and so that, that this works. I was happy to see this work. Um, this is one of the problems that people complain about a lot. Um, I can say spec solve HDF5 caret mPitch, and this is my sort of prototype. 
um, and it shows the spec that results and it, it's able to, to resolve it just fine. Um, it figures out that when you ask for mpitch to be in the DAG, that it has to turn on the MPI variant here. Um, and, and likewise, if you know, it, it's smart enough to figure out it can turn off variants in different places too. Um, what was interesting was I said, okay, so now I'm gonna test it. I'm gonna say, build me HDF5 without MPI, but mpitch has to be in the DAG. That should fail, right? And so um, I did that and it was like, nope. I discovered, it, it discovered that HDF5 can depend on libAEC, which can depend on CMake, which can depend on libarchive, which can depend on LZ4, which can depend on Valgrind, which optionally depends on MPI for some configurations. And so it's stuck an mpitch in the graph way down here um, to satisfy the, the caret mpitch that I asked for, even though I said turn off MPI on HDF5. And so, um, you know, that's not exactly what you would expect. Um, that's not the, the greatest resolution. Um, the, the trick here, I think, is that um, we are exploring through build dependencies here. And so we were able to get rid of this problem by just saying, when, when you say that a node has to be in a DAG, um, that doesn't mean that it should be reachable through some build dependency like CMake. Um, just explore through the link and run dependencies for the, uh, for the thing you're building and you'll be fine. And so um, hammering out all the different unexpected behaviors um, has been interesting. But I think this is a good example of how the solvers are pretty darn smart. Um, the fact that it can find this configuration. I actually went through and said, okay, well, now build with HDF5 without MPI and Valgrind without MPI, and it found something else that depended on MPI in the graph. And, and it was actually somewhat hard to keep MPI out of the build if you did this um, until we disabled it for build dependencies. So it's been interesting getting this new resolver working. Um, getting information about errors is, is kind of tough. Um, good, good error messages are important. You'd like to know why the graph is unsatisfiable. Um, there's a thing called PubGrub for the Dart package manager that generates a proof of why the DAG isn't satisfiable. That's something that we could explore with Z3. Um, current, the, the Klingo solver has actually added the ability to have unsatisfiable cores. And so now we have a version of this thing that will tell you um, what the conflicting constraints are if you get an unsatisfiable graph. And so it will say, you know, the, the fact that you asked for this version and only these versions are available is why your graph is unsatisfiable. Uh, and so things have gotten quite a bit better uh, since I made this slide, but we're still working on error messages for this stuff. All right, so the new concretizer, we should have an experimental prototype of this in 016, that's the goal. Um, and then I think we will have a production version of it in, um, in 017 um, after we let people try it out a little bit in the wild. But expect to be uh, trying this stuff out pretty soon. Um, it, it's nearly ready. All right. So finally, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the roadmap for 0.16. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do for 0.16 is to um, make sharing a SPAC instance easier. Um, we want it to be possible to have multiple users installing into one SPAC instance or installing into their home directory using the same SPAC instance. And currently, that requires a bit of configuration to get right. Um, we are planning to get rid of the some of the configuration until they slash dot SPAC. Um, the users have been complaining that um, if you put a compilers.yaml or a packages.yaml or some of our config files in your home directory, um, it tends to be an unwanted global. If you have you know, two different SPAC instances where you're trying to do different things, um, or if you wanna have environments, these configs are still considered. And so um, I think what we're gonna move towards is um, configuration in environments instead. Um, that sort of conflicts with sharing a SPAC instance where we're trying to move state out of the, the SPAC prefix itself. Um, we, we're gonna move, you know, for facility installations, installations into, it, we're gonna make it so that the installations go into your home directory if you're just a normal user using facility SPAC. Um, and so reconciling these two constraints has been interesting. Um, I think what we've pretty much decided is we will have configuration associated with different install locations um, so in this mode, if you install into your home directory, um, you'll have some configuration associated with that. And there will be some configuration associated with the facility installs. Um, but we won't have this global configuration that applies to everything across all of your SPAC instances. Um, so that's something that we're working out. Um, the other thing that, that we are working pretty actively on right now um, is we are going to make compilers into proper dependencies. And um, the reason that we want to do this is because right now we don't handle a few things well. Um, we don't handle um, ABI issues between different compilers as well as we'd like. So things like lib standard C++ or lib C++ compatibility, um, we don't model that currently. And so we, uh, we just sort of leave it up to you if you decide to mix compilers in a stack graph. You, it's, it's on you to ensure that they use um, compatible runtime libraries. 
Um, the other thing that we don't handle as well as we'd like is you know, things like OpenMP, same reason. Um, we, we don't model the runtime libraries. And we also don't um, handle mixed compilers as well as we'd like to. So every node thinks it's built with one compiler, but that sort of implies that you're building with a particular C compiler, C++ compiler, and Fortran compiler. But for things like Clang, you want to mix compilers. And so people sort of shoehorn G Fortran into their Clang installation by messing with the configs. And so what we'd like is to have that model better in the graph. Um, and so that would enable us to do things like this over here, where if I have package two here, it was built with an older version of the Intel compiler that used this version of GCC. Um, and it has this version of libstandard C++. We would put this sort of synthetic node into the graph for libstandard C++. So that if I build another package that then depends on that one, um, I can ensure that it uses a compatible version of libstandard C++ and that it picks a version of GCC for the libstandard C++ that goes along with what it's building against. Um, so essentially, we would allow you to, to validate um, ABI compatibility of your runtime libraries in the DAG. Um, the other thing that we would be doing there is um, languages would become virtual dependencies. Um, and this is kind of cool because if you look at the spec packages right now, some of them can get kind of ugly. Um, people have to say that they conflict with certain compilers or that they only work with compilers at a certain version or higher. And um, you know what you would rather say is that you you need C++ 11 or you need C++ 17 to, to run your program or you need Fortran at a particular spec or OpenMP at a particular uh, version. Um, that's pretty much the semantics that we have for virtual dependencies right now, where you can say, I need MPI 2 or higher. We just can't do it for compilers because they're not dependencies. And so once we do this, essentially the compilers will be virtual dependency providers. Um, and the package specification in terms of you know, what language level is needed will be much simpler. You can say, I depend on C++, I depend on Fortran, and we will resolve that with a, with a correct compiler, or we'll check um, that the compiler that you picked supports what the package wants. Um, so hopefully this will make things a lot better. Um, and you know, with the external find functionality that I talked about earlier, um, things like compiler detection, um, where we were doing that sort of as a special one-off for compilers, um, we can use the, the external find functionality to implement compiler detection um, in this model, um, even though we're, we're switching them from sort of attributes on the nodes to dependencies. All right, so that's it for um, the roadmap. I guess I can open it up for questions now. Hey, Todd, thank you. Yes, we have a bunch of questions there. Do you see the Q&A? <laughs> um, is, is it in the Google Doc? I, it to... is in the Google Doc, yes. Okay. I think it is easier if you just go and take a look. There, there are likely a whole lot more questions than we'll ever get time for. So why don't we, Osni, you show you're concluding the slide so that people can then leave. Um, but then if you want to stick around and Todd, if you have time, maybe we could spend another 10 or 15 minutes going through the questions. I, don't know if you I can stay alive. I can probably stick around for as long as you want uh, okay. to answer questions. I've got Perfect. an hour. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. So why don't you go ahead and start looking at the questions and Osni, how about you show that last slide? Okay. Uh, do I have to stop presenting? No, I'll, I'll take over. Okay. So yes, uh, thank you for you um, uh, folks that uh, need to disconnect now. Um, uh, actually for the ones that are going to continue with us as well. So uh, I would like you folks to give us feedback so uh, we can improve the, uh, the series. Uh, some people are asking already about the, web, the, uh, the slides. The, the slides and the recording are going to be available online and we'll be also sending the, uh, the slides. Uh, I think I would send again to the people who have signned up. Yep. Uh, and and the uh, new version. Uh, I'll send you the latest slides, Asni, so that you can- Okay, the great, slides. yes. So, uh, and the next webinar in the series is going to be in about a month on the color mapping strategies for large multivariate data and scientific applications. Uh, it will be presented by Francis Francesca Samsel from the, from the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And we uh, uh, so that event is already open for you know, signing up for people interested in, um, uh, in that topic. So back to you then, Todd. OK, um, I guess I will share the doc. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop sharing here. Let's see if I can Oops. get. This. Yeah, that would be great. I think that would help for sure. Uh, I'll share this. Can everybody see this? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, and I guess I'll. Well, like I'll bigger. just like uh, uh, yes, Todd. Just a, a second here. We are also be sending the questions and answers to folks, uh, and also this will be available online. Okay, great. 
Um, so uh, I guess for the first question, it's is, is there a way to drop into a Python debugger when installing the package? Um, there's not currently a way to, to drop into a Python debugger because of the way that we route output during the, the build. Um, and so you do have to use spec build env. Um, that, that's on the list of things we could look at, but I think it's, uh, it's probably not on the near term roadmap. Um, you can basically de do debugging of the package on the command line. Um, and we try to spit out exceptions that have information about where things in the Python code went wrong. So yeah, so, sorry. Um, okay, so the public spec mirror we're spec can install from a build cache. Um, which Arch compiler and MPI does it support? Okay, so uh, I should clarify that the current public spec mirror is just for source code right now. So what we've done is we've taken every tarball of source code and all the patches and resources that you need to build and put them in the mirror. Um, E4S has a public spec mirror for their builds. Um, and I believe those are targeted at particular containers. And so if you get one of the E4S containers um, and um, you get the version of spec that they built E4S with, um, you should be able to use the E4S build cache. And so there's more on that at E4S.io. Um, what we are trying to move towards is a model where we essentially have a rolling release of binaries on develop for some combination of architectures and compilers and MPIs. And so I think uh, what we would probably target first would be um, you know, CentOS, um, some version of CentOS that we can build with cloud for x86. Um, probably some, you know, uh, some generation of the Intel chip that maybe does have Skylake and another one, or th that does have AVX 512 and another that doesn't. Um, and we'd like to support ARM as well. Um, I think for the build caches we, and for E4S, um, E4S builds with mpitch. And so they do that because that's compatible with most of the vendor MPIs on the systems, we don't currently have an open MPI version of it. Um, but typically in a container, if you're gonna bind mount the system MPI, you want mpitch. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what people want uh, because I, I don't have a good way to gauge that right now. Um, and maybe you know, uh, we can start including more different MPIs. That's definitely the goal is to have um, build caches available for the common things that people wanna build. All right. Um, so let's see, if I need to pass options down to the CMake that builds my package, how do I do that? So for that, um, I guess I'll, I'll share my whole screen. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Desktop one. Can you see PowerPoint two now? Awesome. We can see, but yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah, if, I, if I go back to the package up here, um, where I showed Kripke here, um, this is how you pass the CMake arguments, at least. So this is a CMake package. It, that's the, the thing that gives us CMake support. Um, essentially, all this all CMake package does is it automatically invokes the CMake command for you. You can make this a regular package like that, where you write the install method yourself. Um, and in fact, we're overwriting it down here. Um, but the CMake args here, um, what, what you can see is like the, you have to pick, the, the packager has to decide what CMake args they're going to support. And so the way that you support that is you, you add some variants to your package like MPI and OpenMP. And then if someone installs Kripke plus MPI plus OpenMP, um, then this is gonna run with enable OpenMP true and enable MPI true. And so um, essentially like you, the way that we modeled this is um, you expose the variants on your package. You expose the knobs that you think people in SPAC care about. And then um, you just pass them to CMake in here. That's, that's what happens, um, but they're customizable. So you can build plus open MP minus MPI, you can build plus MPI minus open MP and so on, and have you know four different versions of your Kripke package with different configurations there. Um, and so you can grep around through the packages and see um, a lot of different ways to, to, to pass arguments. All right, yeah. So um, could there be a flag to not build the latest version of all dependencies for the particular stack package? But yes. So um, for this one right here, um, I, think, I think this answer, Osni, is for the prior question. Um, but for, so, okay. So for this key question, um, is there a way to not build the latest version? With the new concretizer, our goal is to prefer the versions that are already installed if they could satisfy the spec. And so we'll keep the current, I guess we, we could call it deterministic behavior where it picks the latest version and, and just goes based on what's in the package. Um, but the default would be that if you've installed an MPI or something, 
um, and you try to concretize a new spec, it'll try to reuse whatever it can from what you've got installed, um, either in your environment or in stack. So this is something that will happen with the new concretizer. Um, we, it's not in the current version, but as of 0 0.16, I'm hoping that you will be able to use this experimentally and then, um, you know, for real in 0 0.17, it'll be the default. Um, so is there a plan to include other build systems? So Bazel is already in there. I want to say Mason is in there too. Um, there are, essentially, SPAC doesn't have um, a constraint on what build system you use on your package. Um, it can do anything. So like the, the most basic package in SPAC is just an install method that does something to get the package installed into a prefix. Um, what we have are these sort of uh, subclasses like I showed over here. Like this is a CMake package. There's, there's, I think, a Basil package and, and maybe a Mason package um, in spec. I'd have to check. Um, but those provide special support for that particular build system. And so that's where this def CMake args is coming from. It's because it's a CMake package. There's a build method somewhere else that's defined around that um, that does, that, that takes this and actually invokes CMake. Um, and there's similar stuff for Basil. And so, like, we're using Basil for TensorFlow in spec right now. All right. Oh, and it looks like someone already got uh, to this. So that's pretty cool. Um, does it make sense to have integration between other package managers? Um, so yeah, this is something that we've thought about. Um, not necessarily for Conan, Hunter, or Nix, but um, definitely for PIP. Um, it's, it's a pain to maintain, like all the Python versions in SPAC. And so if for some of these package managers, um, we could have wrappers around uh, the, you know, language specific package manager. I think that would be really good. Um, for stuff like Nix, I mean, Nix is essentially, it, it's trying to accomplish a similar goal to SPAC, but I don't know how we would map um, a Nix package to a SPAC package because essentially we, we'd have to parse the functions in the Nix package, figure out the variants and so on. I think the translation would be pretty awkward. Um, so for some of these, no, but for others, yes. Like I, I think for, for language specific package managers, it would make a lot of sense for us to just adapt the particular languages package manager and have SPAC build with that um, for, for a lot of these cases. So um, it, I'd say that's on the far out roadmap, but not like near term. Um, how can you tell what options this package, uh, package supports? Yeah, so this is already answered. SPAC info package name will tell you. Um, you can also do SPAC edit package name if you want to see the code behind it, but I think SPAC info is a better version. Um, the other thing you could do is you could go to spac.readthedocs.io um, and there's a whole list of packages over here. And so if you want to see, you know, what, what options that Adios supports, um, you can click on Adios and get, you know, information here about Adios and it links to the package file. It tells you what versions are available, what build dependencies and so on are there. So there's that. Um, how can I know the process of the build? For example, six of 10 dependencies built. Yeah, that's something that we could do better. Um, we print out what we're building right now. We don't tell you what's already installed. Um, probably the, the best thing that you could do there is, um, at least right now, uh, is you could run spec spec dash capital I. So if you run spec spec dash I thing to build like this. Um, this will tell you the install status of, of what's, it'll tell you what's already installed. And, and so you can see what's built and what's not. Um, one of the things on the list that we, that we have to do is um, now that we've implemented the new parallel build, we do know up front everything that we're going to need to build. And so we could print a better diagnostic message beforehand saying how far along we are, how many packages are built. Um, but yeah, we don't do that yet. Uh, okay. Is there any desire for or plan to implement CI tests for packages before they emerge in the main repo? So yes, and I think, I mean, so that's essentially what we are doing with the E4S pipeline right now. So for the packages that are in the E4S, um, we are building them. So if the package changed, uh, we will rebuild them. And if it breaks, then we will um, we'll hold up the PR. And so our goal is to just keep expanding uh, the set of things that we do that for. Um, the obvious problem there is that like one spec template, uh, um, you could build that a million different ways. And so what we will likely do is, you know, test some subset of them, um, or, you know, maybe just the defaults back install HDF5 and hold up the build, um, or hold up the merge if, uh, something goes wrong there. So we'll have some set of sort of canonical configurations that have to pass, uh, for a package to build. And right now that's just the, that's what's in E4S. 
Um, so you can do this. Um, so for, can I ask to build a package with the same dependencies and other packages previously built with? You can specify them individually right now. So you can say stack install, say um, HDF5, caret hash, um, and then you can say ABC123 here where this is the hash of existing mpitch, right? And you can actually put the name on that too. You can say mpitch slash abc123. Um, but you do have to specify them all by hash, so it's a little more tedious than it could be. You may want to use stack YAML for those types of preferences. Uh, oh, yeah, so some other people have some recommendations, so that's cool. Um, this is actually good advice. Um, if you if you put packages preferences in your stack.yaml, so go to um, the build customization section of the stack docs over here, um, and you can go to concretization preferences. You can sort of pin what your environment is going to do. You can say always build with this M pitch or always build with this version of a dependency, and you can construct an environment where everything is built with just that. Um, so that's that's a way to do it. All right. Um, Will stack external find find packages installed by stack already by a prior stack install command? Um, so right now it searches your path. It does not search what's installed by stack. Uh, so no, but those things could already be used as dependencies because they're installed. So, so there's that. Um, and I, I think this is related to the earlier question of will you reuse existing installs more aggressively? And the answer to that is yes. All right. Um, is there a way to keep the source code of a package? Yeah, you can do this. Um, so this is one way to do it. Spack install dash dash keep stage will keep the build around, but then it'll, that's still in temp. So I would say this is still in temp. So, so it's a little volatile. Um, what you can do is, um, let me see if I can find it over here. Uh, so bring up, I'm, I'm blanking on what the argument is in my shell session is slow. You can say stack install dash dash source and it'll keep it around. So uh, let's go back here. Yeah, oh, okay, thanks. So spec install dash dash source, we'll put that into um, share spec source. Um, is there any automated testing of E4S with CUDA? Not yet, but there definitely will be. There's an ECP funded project to test E4S with all three different GPUs that DOE cares about. So E4S is going to get tested with CUDA, AMD GPUs, and um, the Intel GPUs. We are going to have an, a webinar on E4S in, uh, I think, January. <laughs> yeah, so, so definitely listen to that. Um, it's, E4S will be tested in a lot of different environments, and, and you'll see that expand. Um, there is a ECP contingency project for next year um, where um, basically we're going to be working with the E4S team to ensure that we're running it and building it regularly on the, the different exascale machines, um, or at least the, the, the early access machines at the different facilities. Um, okay, what are the differences between SPAC and Geeks? Um, so uh, SPAC and Geeks, so Geeks is a lot like Nix. Um, Geeks is basically Nix, but implemented in Scheme. And um, it's also the GNU version of Nix. It has a more, I guess, restrictive license. Um, I, I would say the main difference between SPAC and Nix or Geeks is that SPAC packages are templated. Um, and that you know, if you want to build lots of versions of something in Nix or Geeks, um, you end up having to hack package recipes a lot more. So the packagers write you know, one version of something. Um, and yes, you can have, you know, you can swap different function parameters in and out of that, but I would say it's generally more cumbersome to do something like swap a compiler into a Nix build or build a Nix uh, build with a different parameter. Um, and so like what I would say is like, you know, if, if you're building with Nix and Geeks, you're hacking, you know, either Haskell-ish Nix language or scheme. And if you're building with SPAC, you're writing templates in Python. Um, and, and that's sort of a fundamental difference. SPAC is designed to build combinatorial versions of things, and Nix and Geeks are very much focused on reproducible versions of exactly this thing. Um, there's a good reference on that on um, Nix Discourse. And so, you know, it's, 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 so if you go to Discourse, the, uh, yeah, this one, discourse.nixos.org, um, and you search for 
back on here. <laughs> there's, there's this unanswered question, um, but there's this question on using any package version in Nix. And so uh, you could read this question. You can paste this into the, um, into the chat. So see that if you want sort of the core of the difference. Um, yeah, all right. How does SPACs, ZACs, and Concretize Together interact before consistency of the package is being installed? OK, so this is complicated. Um, concretize Together is really not for stacks. It's for regular environments. And so Concretize Together says, make this virtual environment a lot like you know, a single prefix environment in a, in a regular OS. Make sure that everything is concretized together. So you can actually enable that on environments now. Um, and that might be a good answer to the, one of the prior questions where um, somebody asked, how do I make sure that my builds all have the same dependencies? Well, if you do concretize together, they will. Um, and it'll fail um, in, in certain cases. Um, if you're doing a SPAC stack, you're probably not concretizing together because you want to build an environment that has things built with different MPIs and different compilers and so on. And so right now, um, what we do is we expand the, the matrix to, the, to just the, the product of the roots. And so you'll get specs like HDF5 built with this compiler and this MPI, HDF5 built with this compiler and this MPI, and we concretize them separately. And so that means that there will be some duplication in the dependencies if there are sl small differences. Um, with the new concretizer, we will be able to minimize that. And so essentially, we'll be able to say, build me the configuration where the roots are different in these ways, um, but the other dependencies are minimal in, in that they, they're shared as much as possible between the different roots. And so that's something that I think will be really good for facilities is that we'll, we'll be able to optimize that you know, for real and, and build sort of the smallest stack for a given specification that we can. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, Let's see. What's the reasoning behind defaulting to using specs on source mirror for source code instead of using it as a fallback? Um, our mirror is more reliable than most of those other sites, and, and it's out of S3. So I mean, one, one of the reasons that I like this is because uh, we've been talking with AWS, and we're, we're looking at maybe putting our mirror into CloudFront. So we would actually have a CDN on our mirror. Um, and also, I guess, one of the reasons that we did this is it's among distributions, it's considered kind of, you know, a, a good faith thing to do to provide a mirror of your own so that you're not spending someone else's bandwidth on your project, um, which is essentially what we've been doing so far. So now we're, we're providing the downloads, um, the stack traffic goes to our site and we pay for it. Um, so I guess that's, that's the main reason. Um, I'd be curious to hear why we shouldn't do that. All right. Um, are all heuristics used in the SPAC case for the new concretizer deterministic? Um, with optimization, yes. So if you, if you don't use optimization in the solve, um, you will just find any solution that works. And so um, you could potentially find like an old version somewhere that still satisfies the spec, but maybe is not deterministic. Um, when you add optimization to that and you say, always find me the most recent version, find me my most preferred compiler and my most, most preferred virtual implementation, um, it is deterministic. And so that, that, that should not be a problem with the new concretizer. All right. Um, I think this was originally the first question. So this is kind of exciting. We must be getting near the end. Um, <laughs> right. All right. So uh, what's the question here? Uh, can we create an environment? So I think we answered this in the presentation. Um, so yes, back installs things with RPAS, um, but you can also make these environments uh, to run your software. So essentially you could think of SPAC environments as like virtual end, but for anything. Um, so yeah, you can have a Fortran virtual environment in SPAC and run your climate code in it. Um, that's totally possible. Um, and that, that was the intent with the SPAC environments was to kind of unify this idea of manifests and lock files from systems like Cargo um, or from Bundler um, with the notion of an environment where essentially like now an environment is this spac.yaml file plus spac.lock plus the ability to get it all into one environment in your shell. Um, and then, yeah, so I think, uh, so I don't, oh, I guess, I guess if you have, if you have a code where you have to recompile to change a parameter, you're still going to have to recompile to change a parameter. We can't change that. Um, without patching the code. So there's that. So, but you can make two environments for that. You can make one environment with the code built one way and another environment with the code built another way. And they would share underlying implementations and just have separate versions of the, of the root code. So um, you could potentially use SPAC to do that um, in an efficient way without wasting a lot of disk space. 
Um, okay, and then I think some other people have tried to answer that. All right, considering the example given for language features as dependencies, uh, since compilers claim to be C++17 compliant when they still aren't, um, do you consider managing specific tool chain differences about language support? So yeah, I think we could do that. Um, if So you, in spec packages uh, provide, can provide more than just one virtual dependency. So I mean, you could have a, a, a C++ implementation or a C++ compiler that provides like lambdas at one version and you know uh, other C++ features at, at other versions. Um, plus lambdas. And then you could have a more fine grained specification of what virtuals you need um, instead of just doing the language level like this. Um, I think we could also have both. I mean, you could have the compiler provide C17 if it's fully compliant. And then, um, you know, we could have others, the, the finer grained things for older versions of the compiler that maybe only support a subset of features. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of up to the packager to decide whether they want to. Um, fully enumerate that or not. Um, and that would determine, you know, which compilers they could build with in spec. Um, okay. So what learning path will you recommend to be able to create new packages that are not already in spec? So um, what I would say is uh, if, if you just, so first of all, um, check out the first slide of the presentation because there's a tutorial in two weeks um, that you can take and it's, it's two days. So you can learn all that you ever wanted to know about stack and contribute that way. Um, the other thing that I would do is just try making a package. Um, you can you can look at the tutorial online. We have links to it. There's a whole packaging guide. So definitely look at the packaging guide. It is down here on the docs. Um, and it's quite long. Like there, there's a lot of information in here. So you could read this. Um, and then I, I would say that probably the best way to get feedback on your package is even if it's not working, just submit your package as a pull request to SPAC because um, I don't know, I like to say that the, the, the best way to get the right answer is to put the wrong answer on the internet. Um, people will comment on your package and will we'll give you feedback. Um, and if that doesn't work, then um, there is SPAC Slack. So you can go to GitHub slash SPAC slash SPAC over here. Um, and if you click this button right here, this Slack button, um, it will take you to this page over here and you can get an invite to our Slack channel. Um, there's 648 people registered on our Slack channel and maybe 50 or 60 are online at any given time. And so if you just ask a question there, um, <laughs> people will be happy to help you um, make a SPAC package. So, and that's, that's over here in, uh, well, I don't have it open, but, but you can try out SPAC Slack. It's available. Uh, let's see. Getting to the end, end. yeah. Good. <laughs> And then I think, okay, well, how should packages be handled where dependencies change frequently? Um, yeah, I, so I think at the moment these things just get messy. Um, and uh, we don't have a very good solution for packages that transition to a different build system. Um, we've started moving some of them to like sort of older legacy packages with the old build system. Um, this is something we probably ought to address once the new concretizer is in and we have a little more bandwidth to deal with, with stuff like this. I think these are two really good questions um, that, that we don't have good answers to. Um, so uh, are there you, if you want examples of these things where the dependencies change, look at like some of the compiler packages. Um, so look at LLVM, look at GCC. Um, they have dependencies that change pretty rapidly. Um, and they just write code in the package. So like one of the nice things about Python is that right inside your class definition, you can put loops and things. And so, you know, LLVM has a loop over all of the different configurations of it that are valid. And so you don't have to write everything out explicitly. You can actually just have the package implicitly enumerate all the different ways that it can be built. Um, that's, that can be harder to read, um, but that's how, how people do it now. So I'd say look at LLVM and GCC, look at some of the more complicated packages in spec. And definitely, if you have suggestions for how we can improve that, then I mean, we th that would be awesome. Um, are there plans to support multiple download URLs depending on variants and spec features? Um, oh, yes, uh, we would. I, I would like to have. Uh, well, so okay. So for spec binaries, um, we can do this. So if if you make a binary package like E4S does. Um, SPAC already handles installing different binaries for different configurations that way um, because you don't have to specify that in the package. Um, but for things that can only be installed from binary, we, yeah, we currently don't have a when clause on the version directive. 
Um, and so we can't say when I'm at this version, um, download this tarball, when I'm at this version, down, uh, when, when I'm at, sorry, when I'm on this architecture, download this tarball, when I'm on this architecture, download this tarball. We don't have very good support for that. Um, I would expect that to be added in the next couple of versions of SPAC because it's a really common question. Um, we just haven't had the bandwidth for it given the other features that we're working on. Um, is there already a Linux distribution that uses SPAC as their main package manager? No, not yet, but maybe once we have glibc in there, they will consider doing that. Um, but I don't know. Um, we, could, we could make one. We could call it SPAC OS. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'd, it, it, it would be a really cool thing to do um, once we have um, compilers as dependencies and these runtime libraries modeled in SPAC to think about that because I think you could basically make I don't know, distro list containers with SPAC, um, where we essentially, we don't rely on a base image at all. We just build from glibc up and, and build your application that way and give you a container. Um, I don't think that would ever be our default mode, um, or at least not in the near future, because I don't, if anyone on the call has ever tried installing Gen2, I think it would be kind of like that if you had to build everything from the kernel up to get your app built. So we don't want that. Um, but you know, th there's definitely interesting things to think about in that space. Um, so yeah, I guess stay tuned. That's longer term, but it's interesting. And I think I did all the great. questions. Yeah, so that's, that's great, Todd. Thank you. I'll uh, just ask you, you know, uh, to take another pass later. To okay. See if everything has been covered in this Q&A. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for st everybody for sticking with us for another half, 30 minutes here almost. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Todd, very <laughs> much. Thanks, everyone. We should have the video um, out in about a week uh, in case you have colleagues who missed it. Um, Todd, thanks for sticking around. Osni, thanks for putting together another good webinar. And everyone have a great rest of the week. Thank you. All right. Thank